Thank you everyone for joining us once again for, this, for our webinar series. We are pleased to welcome today's speaker, Kwasi Oke Boateng, who will be talking to us about switching a career in cybersecurity. You can ask questions using the Q&A feature and he will respond at the end of his presentation. Kwasi has 10 years of experience in the telecommunications industry. During his time, he was part of teams that successfully rolled out projects with notable companies such as Ericsson and Huawei. He became a lecturer at the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration. He's currently pursuing his PhD in cybersecurity at the University of New Brunswick. And he's working as a research assistant at the Canadian Institute for Cybersecurity, CIC. He has worked on projects with CIC partners such as Siemens and IBM. His research interests are trust, security, and threat intelligence sharing within the smart grid. Kwesi, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Awele, um, for the introduction. So, hi. Uh, so today we'll be talking about um, switching to a career in cybersecurity. Um, as I already mentioned, my name is Kusi Wachawating. So um, let's get started. So somebody may ask, uh, why cybersecurity? Well, I'll just give you the explanation now, or I'll try and convince you and hopefully see if, and we'll see if you can, if you will think about it. So now let's start with some statistics. We all love stats, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of data that flows around, right? Um, you're having a lot of emails being sent every minute around, you know, 200 every minute. You're having about 50 posts on social media and stuff like that, right? Now, we're really connected to the cyber domain, like the cyber infrastructure. Now, anytime you connect something to the cyber um, domain or in include um, digital technology, your attack surface actually also increases, which means you are more prone to attack. Now, one of the things that you should know is that um, in 2019, for example, $3.92 billion was a cost for data breaches in the United States. Now, another thing that you should also know is that people are still trying to get cybersecurity professionals, and there's a huge vacancy. Um, so again, let me give you the stats on this. So now we are having a 15% unemployment rate across the cybersecurity jobs landscape. That's number one. And then the other thing is that it takes 21% longer to actually hire or to fill a cybersecurity role than IT jobs, usually because you need to find people that can actually do the job. So now what happens now with a lot of companies is that they tend to now poach people. So you'd have recruiters actually talking to professionals that actually have a job um, just to try and lure them away, you know, with the big bucks. So that's one of the key things. So because there's that sort of um, demand, and as you can see, the supply is not fitting the demand, right? So what this means is that within a lot of organizations, you are going to have a lot of churn when it comes to employees. They, they keep getting out the window. So another stats, for example, here in Canada, 65% um, of businesses actually expect future ransomware attacks. Now, in the previous year, that was like 39% were that were actually victims and 65% actually expect to be attacked right and that is and the thing is that is increasing now another thing too is that um in canada alone we also have in around twenty five thousand jobs that are actually unfilled and that demand is high and it's increasing as the day goes by so anytime and and the, and the interesting thing is that when you have more infrastructure more technology and stuff like that it means you need jobs to fill those positions to find a way to protect that sort of uh, infrastructure. Now, globally in 20, 2021, 3.5 million 
jobs that are unfilled. And that was a projection in 2021, and currently is more. In the US alone is around 500,000 job postings that are actually unfilled. Uh, you may you may probably look at LinkedIn, for example, and just search cybersecurity jobs and you see how long it takes. I've seen quite a number of being reposted for as long as six months. So the same with, with Europe, um, India, and then even in Australia, where they also say that there's a shortage. And currently, as we speak, there are quite a number of attacks, cyber attacks happening in Australia as we speak. So the demand is, is still there. Again, let me give you some more stats um, for this. Assuming that we are having on jobs that are being filled at the moment, even though there are still um, efforts by companies to probably try and automate, um, and that would also take time. Now, these are the stats here that you would see. In 2021, every 11 seconds, a consumer is actually suffering or suffered from a ransomware attack. And it is projected that 10 years later down the line, it will reduce to two, two seconds. So every two seconds, a ransomware attack. Now, anytime an attack happens, right? For example, a, a, a ransomware damage, um, there's, quite a, there's, quite a, there's quite a cost there. Now, it is also projected that in 2030, 2031, the damage caused by ransomware alone is going to be 265 billion and um, and this is just ransomware we haven't looked at other forms of attacks now so what this means is by 2025 we're going to have 10.5 trillion being cost and if you want to defend from from now to 2025 you're looking at 1.75 now in, anytime there are attacks right you need to have your systems insured and the projection for insurance by 2031 is going to be around 34 billion. And as of last year, it was 8.5. And because now people are actually connecting over to the internet, the expectation is that the cost per population, even for this year alone, which is like 75% of people that are already connected to the internet, that's 65% of the population, that cost for of attacks is going to be around $6 billion. So these are the stats. So that's one of the reasons why you need people because we need people to actually help to fight this. Now, you're asking, how are you going to switch? So now in switching, um, I will walk you through that because usually I would give a category of, of the kind of people that, that want to switch. Um, let's just say you have no experience in IT at all. I would also still give some recommendations on what you can do. But um, again, for anyone, be it an IT professional or be it um, a non-IT professional, one of the things that you need to know when you, if you want to make that switch is that you really need to know something about the system that you want to protect. So for example, if your bodyguard and you wanted to protect the house, you need to know everything about the house, the ins and outs, any secret entrances, so that you can fully protect that house. That's the same thing if you're trying to make a switch into cybersecurity. There are domains that you can look at where you would want to protect. So, and they range from the basics as Atomic as looking at the software and the hardware. And of course, these two would then transform to um, other domains like your cloud, like your website, your critical infrastructure, and for an internet of things. My specialty as uh, Awele mentioned is in critical infrastructure. So you need to understand these domains and you can actually zoom down. This is just a high level, but you can zoom down on that. Once you can zoom down on that, that is a good start for you to know what you would like to protect. Now, another thing would be to assess your profession. So as I had already placed these categories here, you have a uh, you can either be a computer science or IT professional, or probably an engineer, somewhere around that same domain, or non-IT. So we are looking at HR, finance, health, and stuff like that. And you can make that switch because um, I've seen people um, make that switch, and it's and it's actually going well, well for them. So let's see what would you do if you are any of those two. So 
if you're a computer science or an IT professional, I mean, the easiest way to start would be to look at um, securing where your profession is or where you're employed. So I'll take myself for an example. Um, as already mentioned, I was in the telecom sector, so it made it easy for me to switch into network security. And because of my bachelor's, I had some courses in, in electrical engineering. So that also made the transition into critical infrastructure also very easy. So I, I look more into you know, securing the network for critical uh, infrastructure systems, uh, be the smart grid. So that is one angle that you can look at. Now, if you're also um, in the non-IT sector, for example, you can find a domain that is or, uh, or, or a job that is almost analogous to your work. So for example, you could be uh, a nurse and you know, um, if you're a nurse, for example, and you was in the emergency before, you would um, triage the emergencies that come in. You, uh, you listen, you observe, right? You pay attention. That is similar to what uh, a security analyst would do or even a SOC analyst would do. And because of that, um, the ability to be able to analyze would, would help very well in your case. Um, so that is one of the things that you can look at. But um, if you're feeling that, you know, this is one you're looking for, you're still not really sure, um, you can look at something that you're very passionate about. Um, say, for example, if you're, if you, your interest in is into cell phones, you really like cell phones, you, you know everything, you need to know about cell phones or an iPhone. You can start from there. How how do you secure that? How do you protect that? And you can you can look at that zone, for example, or you can actually start from a hacker or an auditor position. Um, some people would, would like would like to say that uh, you know attacking stuff is easy, right? Uh, you know, you can throw anything at it. But um, one of the things when you start with that with with, uh, with being a, a hacker is that uh, if you're starting. Um, with these kind of jobs is that you can start, you observe, you see the outcome and the more that happens, you try and understand why it works and how it worked the way it worked. And that then expands your knowledge on that. And then based from, from that aspect, you can easily switch to another, um, another category if need be. And the same thing for an auditor. Because for auditors, they, they would have uh, policies and frameworks and regulations and need, need to make sure that the system infrastructure of a company actually aligns with those policies. So once you look at them, you would understand, okay, what is an IAM? How do these IAMs work? Um, and, and then expand from there. So that is one, one option that you can look at. So now going on to the categories which I mentioned previously. So... Um, this is the category that I have actually um, placed them in just to make it easy for easy comprehension, right? Within a job frame, I would say you can have the attacker, the defendant, and the designer. So attacker is mostly ethical. That's, that's uh, I'm actually trying to say ethical, but not for your own personal gain. But people would say white hat. So um, you have the pen testers or penetration testers or pen testers. Those attack. Um, those would actually try to find um, or find um, to test the integrity of maybe a web application or a system um, or a service. They have a red team. Um, sometimes people tend to confuse the red teamer with a pen tester, but red teamers actually behave like an attacker, and for them, is a is a no holds barred thing. So they would actually try and find. Um, vulnerabilities, try, try and find a way to penetrate into a system, maintain their presence, compromise the system and get out. So usually that's how the drill is more like a advanced persistent threats sort of um, uh, thing. So for, because, of the, um, because of lack of time, I won't touch too much on what the attacker is. So I'll just jump to the other two. So you look at Threat Hunter and the Threat Hunter actually uses the um, Threat intelligence that has been gained from other organizations and then applies that to um, artifacts or evidences that has that they have within their organization to check and see whether um, the system has been compromised. 
Then we also have the incident response team member. Uh, so these guys actually, when there's an attack on the system, they, their job is to actually isolate the system that has been compromised from the entire network, eliminate the threats or co contain, eliminate, and then um, perform a, a, a recovery. So that's what they do, which is an interesting thing. And then we have the designers. So you have a security architect, for example, would actually make sure that um, your infrastructure is secure, ensuring that security protocols are or security frameworks are actually um, applied within your organization. And you also have the cybersecurity researcher, which is what I do. We try to find um, novel ways of actually um, vector of protecting um, infrastructure or also identify um, different attack models um, so as to protect the organization or a system. So the switch. So there are actually two ways that you can do the switch, which would mean, um, well, you can actually combine them. Uh, the quickest, I'll say quickest, would be to uh, perform, uh, to actually acquire a professional certificate. Um, and one of the things is most organizations um, look at um, professional certificates as um, if, if, you are, if you actually acquired one, it means that chances are you are legit. Now, I put quickest in quotes because um, that's what people will usually think, tell you that that's usually the quickest way. Um, if you're someone and you're really new, trying to acquire the certificate might be a bit challenging because you might be learning some concepts um, that may be new to you. So usually that's why some professional certificates start with um, some rules like as, uh, associate just to let you know um, understand just to ease your name. Now you have degrees and diplomas and um, I, the reason why professional certificates are relatively quicker is because degrees and diplomas usually take at least a year, but they give you that foundation that sometimes you may not find within certificates. You, you can understand computers, you can understand uh, mobile devices, um, architectures and stuff like that, which will form the basis. If you recall the previous levels, the previous slides, you need to understand what you're protecting. And usually when you're having, when you go for a degree or a diploma, these ones would actually help you with that. So with that, for example, you can actually combine that with a professional certificate and that sort of solidifies your, your reputation. So now let's look at some jobs um, and then the professional certificates that come with it. So we're looking at the pen tester. So I pulled this website, I pulled this from the cyberseek.org website which uh, the description, the source is below. So that actually, they're, they're, what they do is that they pull um, job applications from online and then run some stats on it. And these are the stats that, that they have. So every salary of a pen tester, and this is for the US, for example, is around um, 100,000 100, US dollars. And then the certifications required are here. So you're having certified ethical car hacker, which has been one of the top ones. Computer Security Plus, and then CISA. And then you have various um, SANS or GIEC certifications as well that you can look at. And some of the, uh, you know, requested um, um, education is actually here as well. And um, these are the current total job openings. That's from um, last year, April up till now. So this is what you're having here, uh, 27,000 jobs unfilled. Now let's look at IT auditor. Uh, as I already mentioned, I picked these two because usually this is always a good starting point. Um, so these are some of the certifications. Uh, you have Computer Security Plus, and then you also have CISA. Um, these two are also a good um, start. Again, um, uh, that is, uh, and this is based on the statistics. So by the way, I mean, no way of from actually advocating for, for uh, these professional certificates, but uh, these are the statistics that are there so these are actually the top ones that i actually mentioned and the average salary is around 100k so usually what happens with these salaries is that sometimes you may start from a certain position where the salary might be low and it might it might, it might not be surprising especially if you're really new and you're not really tested but within a span of three years with the, with the right experience you should be able to make it to the top or and be and be earning top dollar now someone might ask uh 
right, all right. If you have these professional degrees, uh, the professional certification, it means you don't really need um, a college degree or a graduate uh, or or a, a grad um, a grad degree or graduate degree. Um, I disagree with that. Now, one of the things that um, I would say is that um, a lot of the outputs that you have, even with computers in general, stem from academia. So you can't do without them. Even from the start, there's a reason why we, we call it about Neumann architecture because that was an academician, right? Um, a lot of these encryption protocols that you have uh, came from academia. And um, you would always have R&D. And as long as there's R&D, you would always need um, academia. You would always need uh, the college, you always need the, the universities. Now, a lot of the courses that are in the universities actually form the foundations for professional certifications. Um, anyone can actually pick the course structure from the university and then compare it side by side with what you have for professional certificates and you, you would see some sort of um, similarities um, that, that actually exists. So that is very, very important. And usually the output from um, research, as I already mentioned, form um, what you need in professional certs, um, certificates and also um, industry also reach out to universities and collaborate with them and help. And, uh, and you have academia also helping them in solving real life problems. And that is what we also do at uh, Canadian Institute for Cybersecurity. So we would have um, researchers that would generate um, efficient intrusion detection algorithms because um, you, need, you need them in, in actually protecting the systems. You also need encryption um, protocols, attack models, all these tools are also required. So definitely also within the ac academia and then also within the R&D section of, of companies, you need people who have degrees to actually do this from masters to PhD in particular. So you need that. So with this, um, I hope that um, I have convinced you in making that switch. Um, so I would also provide, a, I've also provided a list of um, um, URLs that you can actually look at um, just to get some information as well. So you have, for example, in the science or well, 20 cooler cyber security careers that you can look at as well. So thank you very much. And I also like to give a huge shout out to Gabriel Agbaba for helping me out in getting the data uh, for this presentation. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you very much, Kwesi, for the wonderful presentation. Um, I have two questions for you. Okay. The first is, do you, do you think it's more difficult to transition from a non-technical background to cybersecurity as opposed to, you know, making the switch from a technical background to cybersecurity? Um, I would say on paper, yes, on paper, uh -huh. yes. Um, but the reality is that it actually depends on the person and how determined they are. I have seen, um, people in having a technical background actually struggle when they are making that switch. And I've actually also seen people who were from zero background at all and actually switched to cybersecurity, um, especially during the COVID era. There were quite a number of people within the non-technical part who used the COVID era, especially when there were lockdowns to actually study and then improve and then they switched and then, you know, now, now they are very comfortable within that domain. So it actually depends on the person and it depends on the determination and um, the understanding needs to be there. Because now there are quite a number of resources from YouTube to whatever that actually makes learning a whole lot easier and a whole lot 
um, simpler. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we have another question. One sec. Some teams. Sorry, one sec. What is a track? What track should I select to switch to security analysts? Okay. Now, if you want to switch uh, to a security analyst, um, so that in itself is the track if you really want to be a security analyst. So um, let's just say you wanted to look at a professional. There are professional certificates out there that can actually let you move to security analysts. Um, again, I, because I don't really want to endorse any certification or any the information is out there you can easily google that but um if you really want to switch one of the easiest ways would be to or the quickest ways would be the quickest ways would be to um pick a professional course in that but truth be told um as i mentioned you really need to have that understanding of what you want to be an analyst for because you can be an, an analyst within uh, um, so if you're an analyst, you're just analyzing um, the system infrastructure. It could be within a bank. It could be uh, within a utility company. It, it could even be within a telecom sector. It could be anywhere at all. So the key thing is if you really want to be an analyst, the first thing that you need to do is know what system that you want to protect first, and then you can, can make that transition. But usually it's general. So you have your normal computers, switches, routers, service and stuff like that so first thing start learning about linux so learning about computers and then you can make that and then you can look at professional certificates that have to do with security analysts that's one part you can start from yes okay um one last question okay um as an entry level cyber security professional mm -hmm. um what kind of jobs should i target would this depend on my previous background and training? Well, I would say your previous background and training would just facilitate uh, to some extent where you want to go. Um, one thing I know for sure is that um, there's quite a number of demand for analysts and even threat hunters because you don't have many. Um, I think the last time I checked, there are about more hackers than than analysts. Um, so if if you are looking at entry, you can you can look at that. Your background may help; it will facilitate, but it is not an impediment if you want to switch. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you really want to switch to anything, there are, there are materials out there that would easily allow you to make that switch. So you can switch to any role at all. It's just, it's just more about the, the job market. And I think for the job market right now, I think there's quite a number of, there's a demand for um, SOC analysts. Yes, for, for SOC analysts, for the defenders mostly, because it's usually hard to defend. So you really need to be uh, one that is very good when it comes to defense, yeah. Okay. okay, we have one question. Mm -hmm. um, a telecommunications engineer from Ghana mm -hmm. who wants to switch to cybersecurity, can you please assist with? Oh no, I think this is different. Can you please assist with best school with cybersecurity in Canada for my MSc? So, UND. I'm sure you've heard the answer, the response yes. is. Yeah, UND. Check out UND. Yes, check out UNB. UNB.ca. Yes. Um, I'm sure that will be your starting point. So yes. I think that's the last question or we have for today. Um, I'd like to thank you so much for you know taking the time to be here with us to speak. Um, we've learned so much from you and um, we hope to have you back again. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Have a wonderful day. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.